Welcome Wargamers, Doug here from 2 Plus Tough with another Path to Glory review. And today we are talking about the titular topic of this month's White Dwarf, the Soulblight Gravelords. If you're new to this series, essentially I wanted to start taking a look at the Path to Glory options available to the various armies that have had supplements come out for them. There's obviously the, the big boys, the new ones that have battle tomes, so that's going to be things like Stormcast, Auric War Clans, and Magakin of Nurgle at the time of recording. But they've also been supplementing a lot of factions through White Dwarfs, like I mentioned before, and so I wanted to take a look at this one because I think there's some really cool things here. Now, of course, this is a full battle tome update with options for both, you know, narrative play, meaning Path to Glory, and matched play. I'm just going to focus on the ones that are army-wide and in open play and narrative play sections. I'm not really worried about the competitive side of things. With that said, let's check it out. And just in case someone asked in the comments, this is White Dwarf issue 471 with the Soul Blight battle tome update. So, let's dive in here. First up, uh, we have their allegiance abilities. This section contains new battle traits. Okay, that's just explaining what these things are. Forget about that. Allegiance abilities. Their core battle trait in the combat phase. After a friendly soul blight, Grave Lord's hero that is not a monster has fought, meaning the camp anyone on a zombie dragon or terror geist. In that phase for the first time, you can pick one friendly summonable unit that has not yet fought in that phase that's within three inches of an enemy unit and wholly within 12 of that friendly soul blight grave lord's hero and they can fight very it's very wordy but it's saying something very simple okay i got some models in front of me i'm just going to grab those if this is your hero and we'll pick these guys as my unit if he fights which you don't generally want them in melee, but hey, vampires can can swing above their weight class. If he fights and there's a summonable unit wholly within 12 that's also actively in combat, no matter who they're fighting, could be a totally different unit, then they can jump the order of activations and fight immediately. So, pretty useful ability. It certainly it lets you kind of get your punches in before your opponent can swing back. Now they kind of modify the Legion of Blood battle trait. So when a Legion of Blood Vampire Lord to your army must decide if they have the martial expertise or the arcane expertise, record your choice on your army roster. So basically when you have a hero, a Vampire Lord from the Legion of Blood, are they good at fighting? Are they good at magic? Cool. If they choose martial, add one of the attacks characteristic of a Deathlance or Vampiric Sword used by a Legion of Blood Vampire Lord that has the martial expertise. Add two to the attacks characteristic of a soul-bound blade weapon used by the Vampire Lord that has it. So it's just giving you the various weapon options for vampire heroes. So you're going to add one to the attacks characteristic if it has a certain weapon, add two if it has the other weapon. That's all there is to it. Now the Arcane, add one to the first casting, dispelling, or unbinding role in each hero phase for a Legion of Blood Vampire Lord that has the arcane expertise and that is mounted on a zombie dragon. Interesting. Add two to this the first casting, dispelling, or unbinding roles if they are not on a zombie dragon. So, again, they're trying to kind of hedge their bets about what people are actually using um it gives a bigger bonus if you're on foot i think for both of these options simply because they didn't want to be suffocatingly good if they are riding something of course over here on the top right we got some mount traits for their various mounts that they can use uh first one is locus of death when you use this deathly invocation ability if you pick a unit that has sorry if you pick this unit as the hero that determines the number of affected units, you can add one to the number of units that are affected. Basically, they can just heal more units around them. That's just a long way of saying it. And then Fetid Miasma, when this unit attacks with its Pestilent Breath, you can reroll the dice that determines the damage characteristic for that attack. There you go. As far as core battalions go, these can be used in both matched play, open play, narrative play, whatever you want. And there are some interesting ones here. Uh, the first one is Rajikar's Court, which used to be a narrative battalion where it has all of the characters from, uh, what is the name of it? Warhammer Quest, Cursed City. That's what it was called. Man, I had a brain fart there. So um, all of the name characters and stuff from there, you can now put them into one faction, which is kind of a nice thing. You, know, you can have a narrative battalion centered around him. It'll get you an extra enhancement. 
It's cool. It's not amazing, but it's cool. The next one is the Fell Wing Flock, which is, you're looking at, what is that? Vargeists, you need two of them, but you can have up to three, and Fell Bats, minimum two, up to three. For that, they get Swift, which allows them to basically do the at the double or forward to victory without a command point being spent. It's interesting. I don't see a lot of those units personally. I mean, I don't see a lot of, I don't know. They're, they're an interesting thing. If you just want a skirmishing, you know, fast moving stuff, it's an interesting battalion. And then their last one is the Death Stent Drove, which is one corpse cart. And I do believe there are multiple types of corpse carts. You have to have a minimum of two dire wolves and two dead walker zombies. And for that you get slayers. So they can use all out attack or unleash hell. None of those things have a gun, so don't worry about unleash hell. Um, all out attack without a command point being spent. You know, is it great? No. Is it cool? Kinda. Yeah, why not? If you want to have a zombie thing, go for it. Go for your zombie thing. I like it. I almost kind of wish that this was um, unified, as if, like, the, you know, the guy in the corpse cart raises the entire field of all four of those units at once. It might be a little bit too much, because those units are particularly great, but it would be really cool and thematic. So we're going to move past open play, we're going to move past match play because that's not what we're here for. We're talking Path to Glory. Summonable units. Now this is a massive change if you are playing Path to Glory to the point where me and my buddy Jeremy are kind of like resetting our uh, rosters because of it. Summonable units are not recorded on your order of battle. Instead, when you pick your army for a battle, you can include up to three summonable units for each Mortark you include in the army, up to two summonable units for each vampire hero that is not a Mortark in your army, and up to one summonable unit for each other Gravelord's hero. So a Necromancer can bring one summonable unit, vampire heroes is two, Mortarks is three. Now they still cost points when you're building your list, but they don't go on your roster. They don't suffer casualties. The idea is you're just collecting dead bodies as you go, which is a really neat thing. Um, for the quest, uh, sorry, so pause right there because I want to emphasize how big that is. We've been doing casualty scores as normal for Path to Glory this entire time, so now they don't count at all. And the number of summonable units you can bring is now tied to what heroes you choose. That's an interesting idea. I like it quite a bit. It certainly is thematic in the sense that all of these vampires... They don't give a crap about the bodies that they're using. They don't even see them as people, right? They wouldn't care if there was a casualty score game to game. They would just find new bodies and jam them in those units. So it's super thematic. I like that. Uh, for their quests, they got this one, right? Just one? Okay. Um, it's called Monstrous Undead Dragons. Some of the zombie dragons ridden by the Soul Blight Gravelord heroes are amongst the most terrifying creatures of their type. Pick one hero with a zombie dragon mount from your order of battle that does not already have a mount trait enhancement. Then pick a mount trait that you're allowed to take. Write down that mount trait in your quest log. At the end of a Path to Glory battle, you complete this quest if that unit destroyed any enemy units during the battle. So, basically, you pick a mount trait, you pick a, a mount, right, whatever zombie dr dragon or whatever you have, and um, if they kill a thing, you get a mountain trait. That's pretty cool, it gets added to your vault. Um, when you complete this quest, you can add the mount trait you picked to your vault, but it can only be given to the unit you picked when you embarked on the quest. If that unit's removed from your order of battle, like they die, die, then remove the mount trait as well. Interesting stuff. Uh, below that, they have some veteran abilities. Now, veteran abilities are very hit or miss. Like, it seems like some were kind of tied to specific units in the Stormcast one. Here, they kind of doubled down on that. They made the veteran literally <laughs> Blood Knights only, Vargeist only, Corpse Cart only, that kind of thing. It didn't really work that way in the Soul and the sorry Stormcast book, but it's one of those things that it kind of did because there's only some units you would actually use those veteran abilities on. So I kind of like this more. It's a bit more transparent, if I'm honest with you. Um, the first one is for Blood Knights, spurred into action. This unit can use this veteran ability uh, once per battle when it uses its Riders of Ruin ability for the first time. When it does so, 
it can run instead of making a normal move and can still charge later in that turn. So they have this ability to kind of back out of combat and come back in. But now that they can run, they can actually back out way further and potentially move from one combat to another to deliver those mortal wounds. Very cool. Eager for Bloodshed is for Vargeists. Um, if this unit is circling high above as a reserve unit, when it's set up, uh, let's see. When it is set up, you can set it up more than 2d6 inches from all enemy units more than 9. So, let's think about this. You get a choice, okay? So you're going to roll 2d6 when you want to set them up. Let me grab a die here. So essentially you get a choice, okay? You get 2d6, roll those out. This would be an 8. I can set them up outside of 8 inches rather than the standard 9. Now let's do, uh, let's say this, five inches. I can choose five inches rather than nine. You can see what's going on here. However, if you were to roll, say, this would be a 10, the Blood Bowl symbols on the six. If you roll a 10, you're like, oh, I don't wanna make my charge worse. I can choose instead to stay outside nine inches. So it's a gamble, but it's an interesting one, right? I mean, it could absolutely go insane. There's not even a minimum for, you know, how far away you can go. So if you roll double ones. So that's a really interesting idea. I like that for Vargais specifically because they are that kind of skirmishing unit. They're gonna come down once, do a charge, and then land the attack kind of a thing. So that's an interesting idea. Now, do you want them within combat? Maybe not, <laughs> maybe not at all, but hey, it's what you can do. The next one is the Corpse Master Seneschal. Uh, and this one is specifically for corpse carts, which I'm gonna be honest, is my favorite unit in Warhammer. I just love the idea of like, I'm just gonna throw a bunch of dead bodies into a cart and now boom, I'm a weapon. I, I love it. Uh, once per battle, this unit can issue a command to a friendly summonable unit that's wholly within 12 of it. Okay, it's simple, it's straightforward, but it gives them an option they didn't really have before. And I like that. Uh, Deathless Abomination, the last one is for Zombie Dragon and Terrorgeist units only. Add one to the wound characteristic of the unit. Now, designer's note, this ability can only be taken for a unit that uh, uses either Zombie Dragon or Terrorgeist War Scrolls. It cannot be taken if it's a mount. Again, so you could have a Vampire Lord on Zombie Dragon, or you could just have a Zombie Dragon. And so they're just saying, if you just take the beast, no mounts, you, this is a, a veteran ability they can have, which, is it powerful? I mean, an extra wound, it might be, why not? But it's, it's just nice to have an option for those kinds of units when you don't have the hero on top. Because if you don't have the hero, you can't give them artifacts and all that kind of, you know what I mean? It just kind of is a nice little freebie for taking the beast without the rider. I dig it. Now, when it comes to territories, I will be the first to say, I think this is the weakest part of Path to Glory is the territories table. Some of them just just don't do anything useful or interesting. So if you roll a, um, was it a 61 through 66, instead of looking at the, uh, the core rules Path to Glory thing, you can choose one of these instead. So if you roll a 61 or 62, for example, you can choose Gravelands. Um, the core, like what you get for choosing this territory, if you add it to your roster, add one to the number of summonable units you can include in your army. So based on all the heroes you have here, you can include an extra one. Now I like that because it plays into a relevant mechanic. That's a cool one. If you upgrade it, uh, Gravelands Pillaged, add three to the number of summonable units. That's rad. Next one is Cursed City, if you roll a 63 or 64. The core one is um, you can never have more than one territory of this type. Fair enough. Pick an allied faction. You can add up to three allied units from that faction to your roster, even if this would exceed your allied units limit. I like that. And this is how you can start bringing in ghosts and all kinds of stuff. Basically, whatever these guys can ally with, which I believe at this point is... So you have Soul Black Grave Lords. They can ally with Night Haunt and... Uh, flesh Eater Quartz. Is there another one? Yeah, no, that's it. But that's alright. That's pretty cool. So you can have a kingdom of, you know, ghoulish dudes and or actual dead people. <laughs> it's cool. Um, 
If you upgrade it for five glory points, when you pick an army, uh, you can choose a hero from this faction as a general of your army. If you do so, for that battle, they gain the Soul Blight Gravelord's keyword and the lineage keyword for your army. So that's an interesting idea. So not only can you take allies, but then you can really bring one into the fold. And I like that quite a bit. So you're just gonna choose a hero from there and they become a Soul Blight Grave Lords. That's cool. The next one, again, I like this because it's relevant to army construction and the way that things, you know, like allies as a core mechanic of the game, how that works. The last one is Blood Grounds. You can never have more than one territory of this type. And my least favorite words in all of Path to Glory, this territory has no effect until it's upgraded. You still have to pay 10 glory points for it. That is such a bummer. I, I just never like it, whatever. Upgrade it for 15 more. So this effect collectively cost 25 glory points. And I think if I'm not mistaken, I could be wrong. Can you upgrade it the turn that you get it? I don't think you can, but Add one to the number of territories your stronghold can control, eh? the number of barracks it can have, and the number of outposts it can establish. Now here's the thing, barracks allows you to put more units on your roster. Outposts do jack. Like, like literally if you look at the side text of outposts in the core book, it says like, future supplements will it'll have outposts that can do stuff. And it's like, cool, neat, super duper. So we don't have that yet. So, I mean, it might it might in the future be really cool. Right now, it just, it kind of sounds like a wet fart to me, but whatever. I really like the first two. That's cool. I'm, I'm down with those. Um, heroic upgrades, I think is the last thing here. Is that right? Yep, it is. Um, during your Path to Glory campaign, you may be able to pick heroic upgrades for your heroes. A heroic upgrade replaces the war scroll of a hero with another more powerful one and represents them becoming a mighty champion. Essentially, if you um, have a base hero and like say, for example, a white king, skeleton hero guy, you can then put him on a steed. You, uh, that's his upgrade. If you have a vampire, you could put him on a zombie dragon. That's all you're doing. You're replacing one scroll, vampire lord, with another one, vampire lord on zombie dragon, uh, without having to lose anything unique about them. So anything that they have, it transfers over. And uh, yeah. Um, let's see, when you pick a hero, a heroic upgrade for a hero, they keep their renown points and any core enhancements they are still eligible for. If your hero had any core enhancements that are no, lo no longer eligible, meaning you can't have a mount, uh, they lose it, which is fair. If this enables you to pick a new one, you can do so. So I can't think of a whole lot of stuff that's really relevant there as far as, you know, having a mount and stuff like that, but I don't know the Gravelord's roster of artifacts and stuff, so whatever. Um, if you have a vampire lord, it requires 30 renown points. They have to really earn it and you spend six glory. You can change them into a vampire lord on zombie dragon. If you have a white king, um, and then you have 20 renown and you spend four glory, they can become a white king on skeletal steed, which actually I had to think about because I forgot that they came out with that super baller version of this. Like I'm still thinking of the derpy like nineties one. Um, the new, the newer White King on Steed is a fantastic model. Um, one note here as a little asterisk, if your order of battle already includes a zombie dragon, you can remove it from your order of battle to have the requirement of renown points and glory points. That is cool. So if you already have the beast and you have the rider, it's way cheaper to just, you know, play your Yu-Gi-Oh fusion card and then have them merge together. Polymerization, that's what it is. Have them merge together into one unit. I like that a lot. That's a cool way to add it. And that's basically it for the Soul Blight Gravelords. So rounding that discussion out a bit, I'm just looking over here. I like the changes to the army. You know, again, I'm not a competitive player. If you're looking for information about that, no, I'm not the channel for it. Go check out Warhammer Weekly. Um, just looking over the Allegiance ability. Legion of Blood seems really cool. Um, I like the battalions they got because they are thematic. I think core battalions are a fun way to just let you still do narrative focused armies, but not have to worry about losing out on things. Like you still get like a, a consolation prize, even if they're derpy, right? The Rajikar's core one with all the Cursed City characters. Are you really going to take it? Maybe not, but you know what? It would be a really fun mission, so why not take it? And this way you're not losing out entirely. 
on some of the other rules that factions can have. The Path to Glory section, I will say, is quite interesting. The move away from having summonable units on your roster is terrific. They still cost points to bring, but these guys would not give less of a crap if, if a couple of zombies died. They would just reanimate them anyway and then throw more bodies on the pile. So I think that was an incredibly cool um, thematic move on their part. Beyond that, you know, the other stuff is pretty simple. They added some mount traits and then a quest to obtain them and then a cool way to upgrade your heroes. And I love that little subtext of like, if you already have a zombie dragon, it's way cheaper just to, you know, A plus B rather than having to go out and hunt a zombie dragon in particular. The veteran abilities, I think, is really where it shines because I like being locked into specific units because it makes me want to bring them to achieve them. It's almost like an achievement than it is just another ability you add to their war scroll. I like that a lot. And the territories, you know, the first two were really cool as far as affecting summonable units because it's relevant to the new rules. I love when they do that. And then the second one, as far as allies go, death factions, not so much soul blight, but the other ones can feel a little limited. So giving you a chance to bring some other cool things in, I like that. And then the other one, I'm kind of like Ipsum Lorem, I don't care because one, it does nothing when you initially buy it. And two, no supplements have outposts yet. So it's like, this is irrelevant. Overall, I like it. Me and my buddy Jeremy and uh, my buddy Rob are all going to be playing uh, Path of Glory here pretty soon. Um, and just just thoroughly enjoying it. So anyway, friends, leave your thoughts about the Soul Blight Grave Lords in Path to Glory specifically in the comments down below, and I will respond to you there. Thank you so much for watching and listening, and I'll catch you next time. Happy Wargaming.